a rear grass of dry land plains. Of course, you've got your birds and your braided rivers, plus the lupins, the foothills, the lakes, of course. And one of the most amazing things in New Zealand, which is the um, gentian flowering that happens up at the tarns near Lake Heron. I know I'm not supposed to be standing out there if I'd read the notice, but it was a while ago now. I mean, this, this should be a national event, the flowering in those um, tarns. It is truly amazing. So, Ashburton, along with all the councils and QE2, signed this document in 2008. It's a biodiversity strategy for the Canterbury region. And it hasn't been reviewed because it's a good document and we certainly haven't fulfilled it. So the first goal in this document, signed by all the councils, is that um, we must protect and maintain the health of all significant habitats and ecosystems. QE2 helps by, um, as a service to private landowners, we can offer them legal protection on areas of natural habitats. And you can see that we've got 23 covenants in Ashburton, mainly around the edges of foothills, but you'll be surprised at the number of little wetlands out on the plains. And we've got 125 hectares. Well, that is significant, and I congratulate those landowners. Uh, <coughs> We perform partnerships with the councils and the landowners. Um, ECAN is a strong partner because they have got a large budget to help us with fencing. But Ashburton District Council has a significant pool of money to, for private land biodiversity. And we split the costs because it's fences that grow trees. Keeping those stock out is the number one conservation action. Sure, you can do lots of other things, but stock removal is like magic. And for a covenant, um, it costs us $626 a hectare in Canterbury to fence and do a little bit of weed and pest control. When you're looking at planting, it's $60,000 a hectare to do planting. It is so economical to protect what you've got. Um, the protected private land is often really important because it's usually the last remnants of these long lost lowland ecosystems. And there I have the Galloway Wetland Covenant, which is quite inauspicious to look at, but has the only site we know of, of the pink orchid in the Ashburton Plains. The wonderfully restored Harris Scientific Reserve that the council owns, and a couple of wetlands. Um, so the, riding, the guiding priority principle is first protect and maintain what remains and then restore what has been lost. So it's not just a matter of conserving habitats. You've got to think about species and genetic variability, which is what all the farmers on the plains know about. So in this version, you've got 140 plant species classified as threatened and at risk. <coughs> They're mainly herbs and grasses. And the regional trend in the last vascular threat list was to a declining condition. You have got things to do. Every natural area in Ashburton has a sustainability issue. And I'm sure you've had Alan Totty in here talking about sycamores. The central photo is 100-year-old Matai in North Canterbury that has completely been um, ringbarked by deer rubbing the trees, a growing problem around New Zealand. And outside the council's scope, but it's certainly something they need to advocate for, deer, pig and goat control. And of course, we have got the intensified farming which need to control weeds around um, their borders, but the downside of that is we, we lose some of our um, scarce biodiversity. One of the places where most of the remnant biodiversity in the plains is found is on the roadsides. And the council, um, a, did pay for surveys and did the best practice by putting a sign up around biodiversity remnants that met the significance criteria in, in the current district plan. The problem with those signs is that's the only one that the um, Transit New Zealand will allow, but they look remarkably like every other sign out there. And we have lost plants even though there's a sign there. I've got, there's a um, a Matagari there, this is around um, Simpsons Road, um, Ferryman's Road area, that's been sprayed out, even though there's a sign close by, 
and this poor piece of kanuka is caught up in the <laughs> edging of the pines. It won't do well with the pines shading it out. There's problems with um, stock use along roadsides. There are tiny remnants that are overlooked and there are planting programs to do. This is all what a biodiversity officer could help us with because you are the representatives of the community and biodiversity is an issue for everyone. If you want to retain these small pieces of natural heritage, which tell us a lot about what was there on the plains, how we've developed, the farming we've got, we actually need somebody in the council who can liaise with landowners, who can advocate and who can bring in people like QE2 when it's necessary. I'm used to working in a team with a biodiversity officer and they kind of lead the project. So you've got the proposed national policy statement heading your way and um, I, would, I see a biodiversity officer as linking landowners to advice and funding. Um, I can bring, I can continue visiting QE2s, but there are other sites like these roadside sites that need somebody to go in, go and talk to the neighbours, find out, ask them if they'd be willing to take their um, pine trees down to keep those precious remnants of Kanuka. There is a lot of work that needs to be done, and at the moment, there's nobody in the council where who's got the capacity to do that on the ground work. There are a lot of people who want to plant. They need advice about how to eco-source plants to keep that genetic variability, to keep those genes in Ashburton that can handle the harsh, dry conditions. And also a biodiversity officer just to be in that tea room to raise the profile of what you've got in Ashburton. Alice, have you got very much more in your submission? Oh, that's it. That's it. We've just got a minute or two for some questions. If anybody has anything to ask about us. Uh, Neil. Oh, good day. Um, just a question on the biodiversity. You talk about 123 hectares covenanted. Yes. We heard from Forest and Bird this morning that there's 55 hectares of indigenous um, biodiversity out there. What's the difference between your 123 and your 55? <laughs> I don't know. I should have talked to them, shouldn't I? Should do. We but whatever it is, 55 to 125, that is so astonishingly small. I mean, it's beyond relic. Yeah, that, that was yes. the point they were making too. And <laughs> for one last question for the biodiversity officer. Do you see that as an office job or will that person be out in the field? I see it as a mix. I see that person has will be a little bit like me with my region. They will be in the council and we've found with um, Selwyn District Council, I'm sure they talked about that. I have a meeting once or twice a year with them. I have a meeting with the Christchurch um, Biodiverse uh, Botanist. And that person will have a very busy job and the job grows as they... Um, the majority of the time would be in the field. No, I think right. it'll be 50-50 because there is a lot of paperwork to do. There's a lot of liaison and things like that. Now, I know what the difference is because we have some re recent covenants they don't know about. Yeah. <laughs> okay. One last question from Councillor Mackay, please. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you very much, Doctor. Um, I would like to comment, but I'm not allowed to comment that your presentation was very good. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you a question? So anyway, my question is, it's based around the words that you said that ECAN had a bigger budget than us. Um, if you were an ordinary ratepayer and just understood issues as headline material in the newspaper, why should that ratepayer pay rates twice for the same job to E10 and to the Ashburton District because Council? Because each agency has a different focus. My agency is legal protection on private land. I can't really step outside that and, and look at road sites. ECAN, as you know, has a real focus on uh, water quality. And so the, whether you like it or not, terrestrial biodiversity lands under the RMA at the council level and the proposed national policy statement is very clear that biodiversity is going to be delivered by councils on behalf of their ratepayers. Um, Are you convinced? Um, I'd like to comment that I'm not arguing with her. <laughs> I'm actually trying to support her but I'm wondering if I'm an ordinary ratepayer, if I'm an ordinary ratepayer, why I pay rates to ECAN who do most of this work. They even do roadside work. I know they do. Yes. Um, 
and yet you're asking the district council to do the same work. Well, they are also, their biodiversity officers, very much connected to the zone committee um, as um, implementation program, and that may change over time. And there will be gaps because their focus is a little bit different to the council's focus. And your focus is to retention and enhancement of the existing biodiversity. And other councils have found that once you create this position, they are very busy. You have a lot of people I know who are wanting to plant, who are wanting to bring back biodiversity to ECAN. Now that just doesn't sit with a lot of, with ECAN or QE2, unless it's related to water. Thank you very much. Oh, Alice, and we very much appreciate your submission. And we can continue this conversation another time. Um, <laughs> I'd now like to invite Is up, it? please, Glenn Ballander, who's the president oh, of yes, the Ashburton sure. Museum and Historical Society. Welcome, Glenn, and thank you very much for your submission. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, from biodiversity to social history. Uh, I can't help but um, reflect that the idea of a biodiversity officer was actually uh, been around for at least 35 years. Um, just as a quick brief introduction here, the society, um, the Ashburton Museum and Historical Society, has been around since six, for 60, 63 years. Um, but further to that, well prior to that, in 1881, um, there was a <clears throat> an association between those people who were interested in preserving the social history of the Ashburton District and Council. Um, that began um, as a museum wanting to be put up by these people um, in 1881, and that was going to be with Council um, uh, approval in what is now Armadillo's area, which was a Crown Reserve at that time. So the point I'm making is that there has been a very long association between um, this society and council. And that, of course, today is uh, controlled by Local Government Act. I don't think there was a Local Government Act in 1881, but there certainly was um, a need for and a recognition for doing something with grandmother's piano. Um, the submission that has been put to you is uh, is concerning the really the management of the museum. Um, all of you have received detailed um, information regarding the background to this issue, um, and the submission put forward by the society is that um, the the idea of downgrading and the idea of having um, amalgamations is not in the best interest of the uh, museum. The society is determined and has a moral and a constitutional responsibility to ensure that the collection um, that is housed in the museum, and a major part of that, and of significant issue as well, nationally and maybe some of it might be internationally, but certainly some national uh, importance, it's a very large collection, and uh, this society has a responsibility, constitutionally and morally, to ensure that it is um, well cared for, which it is. Um, but I think it's important that provision is being made for the future uh, so that trained, professional, experienced people are employed to ensure the longevity of the, not only the profession, but also the collection. So that is a, a main call of that uh, submission. Um, and in doing so, uh, by making sure that there's a provision for um, trained professional directors, then that will ensure, or help, certainly help ensure, um, that your history is actually properly cared for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Glenn. Do any councillors have questions of oh, Mr Ballander? Oh, John. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your submission to Mr. Bellner. Um, basically, you're asking for a dedicated museum director on this. Okay. If I turn that on its head, by not employing a dedicated museum director, are you saying the ADC is not abiding by accepted and appropriate museum industry standards? 
Possibly. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much for your submission, Glenn. Thank you. I'd now like to call up Dan McLaughlin from the Methodist Community Board to present his submission, please. Welcome, Dan. Are you doing the same time, Calvin, as well? Oh, I'm just packing up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Cool. Good afternoon. Obviously, I'm Dan Lott from the Methven Community Board and Kelvin Holmes, also from the Methven Community Board. And also, Kelvin's got a submission after uh, the Community Board. So, we're sort of combining it to save you a bit of time, hopefully. Uh, so, you would have read our submission. Uh, the, the first one is water meters. So, our concern from the Community Board's point is. Obviously, there's water leaks in the district, and how, how what percentage that is, who knows. But we'd just like to see that all avenues are explored on finding these leaks before we just randomly put in water meters. It's a huge cost to the district, and we'd like to see that you look at all avenues of finding those leaks first, all possible avenues of finding those leaks first before we go ahead and put the meters in. But if the meters did have to go in, we'd like to see it spread over three years. Uh, our second one was elderly persons housing. We'd we sort of said over seven years on that one. Uh, we've submitted before on this one and we've also reiterated again that we do question should council be involved in social housing uh, and I know council's been looking at that and uh, our, our concern is obviously council's not that good at it because you're going to run out of money in two years time so are they the best avenue to do that but that's up to you guys. Uh, the next one is wastewater. Obviously that's uh, quite a large one for Methven because it's increasing our rates quite dramatically. Uh, it's between a rock and a hard place because we do we have seen benefits of joining the waste out uh, of the water scheme. So it, it is a big chunk of money up front and it's add to a huge percentage of our rates increase. Uh, but long term benefits we do see some benefits in that. And at a couple of public meetings it's I've heard councillors uh, say hindsight they should have been combined together. Mm -hmm. And yet, hindsight's a great thing, but that's the idea of these 10 year plans. So you can actually do some planning. So you could question is it hindsight or was there not enough planning done? So that would be a, something that probably need to look at in the future of things like that. Uh, admin costs. So for the Miffin Community Board, we pay, uh, well, the the council charges us for overheads and this, this year there's a very large increase into those overheads so we'd like that to be reviewed and uh, we see a few errors in that budget and we'd like to have them reviewed and corrected if possible. Uh, we have spoken to staff about that and so just want to reiterate that, that there are a few errors and large increases. The <coughs> next one was infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of concern in the community around the Methven area uh, about infrastructure keeping up with growth and at one of the public meetings Tony Durham explained how the uh, numbers come about for population growth, uh, explained it very well, even though you can see some major flaws in the system, it's the system's fault not the way it's done it, but the good thing about that they are reviewed every three years when an annual plan comes around so it's not like we have to wait 30 years and find out you got it drastically wrong, it can't be corrected. Uh, but we, we'd like council to look at the infrastructure and the area and, and see if it is keeping up uh, with, with the growth. I mean, you, you can do the desktop assessment like they did, or you can drive around your car and you can see that growth is huge. Or you could even do it from the council thing. There's a lot of houses going up, so you've got a record of what those houses are. The last one on the list was we submitted to the finance uh, and revenue policy. And on the halls and reserve boards, we were saying that we didn't think it was fair. And in your document, also said that the beneficiary of halls and reserves was the wider community. But yet, when it came to deliberation, and you chose to make it a targeted rate on a, on a small area, where well, you've just got to go to one of those reserves on a like country day we just had in the weekend. Most of those people don't actually live in Methven; they live around the district, around the greater area. Uh, area. So to see that. 
just people in the small area have to pay for all those facilities. So 100% targeted rate is, is perhaps, perhaps a bit wrong. Uh, we know we can't change that policy. That's what was set down. Calvin has, uh, in his submission, some ideas on that. And from a community support point of view, we uh, would really like to support Calvin on that. You don't think that's my... No. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, Councillor McMillan. Thank you. Nice to see you, Dan and Calvin. Um, just a question. Uh, we've been hearing about the methane rate rise for quite a while since it was um, the information was released by the media and then again council during the consultation. Is there anything you can see that could be taken out of the um, long-term plan that would assist with bringing that rate rise down? Have you, has the community board, I mean, and obviously I sit in on all your meetings, but has there been anything apart from, and I, I know Calvin's submission um, about the hall and also about the um, the targeted rate for the, the hall and the domain board, but is there anything else that you've come up with that could bring that rate rise down? So we haven't come up with uh, a solution, but uh, we did talk about it and re review it and so if you use something like footpaths as an example we could take out footpathing would bring our rates down and take it out for two years bring our rates down so a few quite a few years ago the council decided no new footpaths in the area uh, and that was put in a rule for seven years so it had no new footpaths it was meant to be to save rates and that's arguable if our rates were cheap or not uh, but what that has done is delayed the infrastructure now in yes, we've got is. a plan where we are trying to put a footpath on every street and that's a 10-year plan so it's 10 more years by the time we get to that by delaying another year or two is just not an answer. Delaying infrastructure is just false economy. So we, we don't see any infrastructure taken out, which makes it challenging. And no, I don't have an easy answer for you. <laughs> you. Councillor Lovett, you have a question? I thought I'd come out of the box here and ask um, the community board, is it still relevant today? I look at Mount Summers and Rakai, they have community associations. Would you ever think, you know, if it's a cheaper option, would that work or do you have to have a community <coughs> board which is quite expensive to run? Yeah, the administration of it is quite expensive to run. Uh, obviously those other ones have volunteers and, and they probably use cheaper resources to, to manage <coughs> their stuff. That comes up for review every five years uh, as part of the council's, uh, part of the local government review and so far we've had Virtually no submissions over the last ten years, but that'll come up again another three years, and that'll be the time to look at that if, if it's viable or not. Good question, though. Thank you, um, uh, Neil. You okay. yeah, just think about the percentages. We always look at the percentages, and methane's percentage is quite high, and because of the reasons we've explained, we other percentages are um, not as high as in the rise. So percentages are good in one way, but bad in another. So I look at it as like a, um, a property, what you actually pay in dollar terms, because that's what hits you in the pocket, is dollars. And you look at the dollars that a Methven property will pay compared to, say, an Ashburton property would pay, and I think they're very, very similar. So it makes it easier, better for me to see that you're not out of whack with the rest of the district. What are your comments on that? That, that is a good way of looking at it, uh, and... Just wang and then in is one thing to get the rates up. So the same as ever at 14.88% is very hard for anyone to swallow. <coughs> I mean, no one else's wages are going up, that sort of thing, or no other costs are going up, sort of thing. I can't put my charges up 14.88%. My customers just won't pay. So the rate payer don't, doesn't have a never-ending budget. And maybe that should be spread over time. Who knows? But you are right in the, the dollar value rate, though. I can't argue against that. Calvin, do you have a response to that? Yeah, I, I guess the what we've seen so far is that Meffin in three years is going to have a 29% increase. So one year is 14, that's all fine. What's it going to look like for everyone else, using your argument, Mr Mayor, in two and a half years' time or two years' time? So I don't know the answer to that because I haven't seen the projected Ashburton one. Or, so... <coughs> It's a big increase whichever way you look at it, and the reasons for it, there's only three reasons for it, which is fine. But it all just, it's betting in in the same year. But you're right about percentages, but it doesn't really tell the true story. 
Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, Carolyn. Afternoon, gentlemen. My question is to the community board. Are you in favour of joining the wastewater club or not? And that's that's what I decide. Either you join the club and pay 14% increase, or you don't, and we say, right oh, you're on your own. And when your wastewater comes up, you fund it. Where's well, the decision? Well, for a start, if we don't join it, it's not a 14% decrease, is it? It's only about 7 So um, I think we've said before in our submission we see the benefit of being in the club. No, no, it's no brainer with a small community. In this case, though, it's just coming in one hit. And I'm, the devil in me would suggest you bought it in this year because Ash Burton's having a huge spend on these wastewater seeds, spreading out a bit more. But I'd be wrong, wouldn't I? <laughs> but <laughs> so I, I, it doesn't matter in that respect, Councillor. In my view, it's good to have it, and the water thing proves it. The, the drinking water proves it. Thank you. And one last question from Councillor Rawlinson. Thank you. Um, Dan, my, I'm just going to challenge you here on um, your comment around the elderly person's housing. You've questioned, you say you question whether we should be involved in any social housing. Um, and did you know that elderly person's housing is not considered social? Social is beneficiaries and everything else in that field. But elderly person's housing is seen as a separate standalone <coughs> It might not be under the social housing umbrella, but it is uh, cheaper housing for the elderly. <coughs> you, you might call it something different, but yeah. it, it's basically the same thing. But it still comes back to you're going to run out of money in two years' time. It's the sa same result if it was social housing or older person's housing. It's it's not yes. working. I understand that. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. Um, now I'd invite you, Calvin, um, to have to <coughs> submit. Well, I, I guess you guys submission? have read my submission, which Dan stole half of it, mm -hmm. so that's all right. <clears throat> um, my concern is, and it's just really, it's just a timing thing. Like, when you did the rating and revenue review last year, you've always got to start at the start and not look to see where it's going to drop at the finish because you'd never get there if you did that. I understand that. But <clears throat> the way this has happened and the way the hall has changed its mode of operation, if you like, in the past six or seven months, some of those costs wouldn't have been apparent, I don't think, when you were doing your rating and revenue policy. That may have been, I don't know. But the longer we run the iHub or the hall in its new situation or its new mm -hmm. state, <coughs> then it shows that, like all iHubs and iSites, we know they don't make money, which is why you clobbered them. Um, but it was a council thought that we should have an iHub or some description up in Methven. And we, as the Mount Hutt community, the, Methven, the Mount Hutt Memorial Hall Committee, decided it would be better that we would run it than the council. They were the two options, it seemed to me. So that's all fine. We are where we are now. But the, the cost of it, as Dan said, being dropped on 1,050 or 80 rating units in Methven is in a very, very tight, tight area. And there's a lot of people just, well, if you took 15k radius of Methven, you get an awful lot of people that use Methven and the hall on a regular basis. So the purpose of my submission is that, as, as far as I understand, the general rate gives rise to the tourism vote that you give, which is, what, a couple of hundred thousand something. It doesn't matter what the figures are. My suggestion is that we put another 30,000 from the MEF and expected community board rate and put it onto general rate, which would actually hardly make a blind bit of difference to the general rate in percentages, um, but it would certainly decrease Methven's rate increase by probably a, a percent and a half. So you'd be bringing it down to, say, 13, rough enough. Mm -hmm. Which, <clears throat> to me, uh, is a bit equitable because that hall is really the, the main hall in the top half of the district, the way it's run. And it's quite a commercial basis, everything else. So. So that was, that's my suggestion. For example, from the last board meeting we had, 
the, the, the March numbers for visitors were 192 and the April were 185. Um, the, the, the bookings are starting to pick up a little bit, things are starting to happen, but at the end of the day, there's still a number of people coming to that centre, I have, that aren't in that Mifflin rating area, and that's why I consider it's a bit unfair. Okay, thank you. Councillor McMillan. Thank you, thanks Calvin, and I think that's a great idea. Um, the numbers that you just um, read out, the 182, um, so they are not Methven residents that are visiting the hall, they're people from outside um, the area, is that correct? That's my understanding, and in the, if you all know that um, that Scarecrow Trail is very popular, and it doesn't include any of those figures, and there's 500 odd bought the $10 ticket at the IHUB, as well as at the Four Square, whatever the numbers were there. So. It's getting used. Yes. It has and a use. Thank you. Can I ask a supplementary? Yeah, of course. Um, so $30,000, so that would basically cover um, wages for the staff that are operating the IHUB, or do you think it needs to, to be a wee bit more? Uh, no, they won't cover the, it won't cover the wages, but that was just my figure. I can make it 50 if you want. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's just a figure as a consideration, I guess, <coughs> as a way forward. Um, Mr Mayor. Yeah, I think you may have answered the question. My question was, where did the $30,000 come from? And you've just <coughs> yeah, grabbed it. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, did you realise that we've actually changed the way the rates, rural amenity rate has been increased to cover all those other halls that have access to it? So Meth and Require and Ashburton and Tumble are a sort of an entity. Yeah. So that all those other this areas outside of Methven could call themselves Bar Hill or Lauriston or something. They're already in an increased rural amenity rate will be playing towards the local halls. And I th would it not be very difficult where you draw a line, went down a road, somebody will say, he's Methven and he's Lauriston. You get into all sorts of... Yeah. How, how would you draw a line, Calvin? Well, I'm not sure that I can, but I'll make it bigger than what it is. That's all. <laughs> because, because the Methven Community Board... Um, boundary is pretty close in, very close in. Um, I, I take your point, you know, who's down that road, is that road, or whatever, like what rugby club you pay for. But um, I understand what you said about the rate that's gone up and everything else, I get that. But I still think it's pretty it's pretty heavy on meth. Okay, Councillor Mackay, you have a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr Holmes, I'd just like to verify. Um, you're, are you suggesting that the uh, I have a donation to the I have of around thirty thousand dollars is added on to the cost structure for tourism that we give to tourism Christchurch, or is part of the tourism Christchurch rate? There's a difference. Do you want it added on to that cost centre, well, that, or to come from that cost centre with the budget it is today? No, I would suggest you want it added on because you've already got a commitment to Christchurch and Zealand, haven't you? <coughs> I'm suggesting you have to add it on. It's just spreading the general rate a bit higher. That's my point. Yes. yes. Supplementary. Supplementary. Yes, of course. Where would this district get the biggest bang for buck um, by sending? say $30,000 to Christchurch for them to spend on us or it being spent in Meffin? A bit unfair, I reckon. Um, Meffin's an, an entity, the hall is an entity in itself conducting operations for Meffin in the surrounding area. It's not, a, it's not about a tourism spend, it's about offering the, in my view, offering the facility for the people the local population almost using it or having that facility, whether they have shows in there or the art galleries often fall down. There's a fair bit going on there. And we have a lot of visitors <coughs> out of, from out of town. We're only open 10 to 2 on a Saturday and Sunday. They went, we're not open big hours, but we're getting, you know, people are turning up. Thank you. And um, last, I'll invite Lynette just to have the last 
question. Well, I was just going to ask, because there have been a survey done since the IHUB opened to see whether the visitors are Methan area or the whole Ashburton district, because then you can proportion funds for the IHUB if we knew that where they were in our district or out. The numbers that I just quoted yes. before were visitors out of town, so out of Methan, not out of Ashburton, but mm -hmm. out of out of Methan. Ter yeah, ter Thank you very much to you both for your submissions. Um, we'll take them on board and get back to you in due course. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite, please, Ian Patterson from the Mid Canterbury Rugby Union to present. Welcome, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. You got it. Great. Totally good. Firstly, thanks to Mayor Brown and councillors and staff for the opportunity to speak uh, to our submission. Mid Canterbury Rugby Union are submitting regarding the proposal in the draft LTP to pause the development of the sports fields at EA Stadium while undertaking research into the best way to utilise the centre. And the draft plan also states that after the study, the project may be rescheduled in the next 10 year plan. And I stress the word may. This is simply not acceptable in our view to read words such as pause and maybe. After all of the community effort that's gone into the EA Stadium planning and the investment which has been put into it, it's just disappointing. Um, the, the site itself was chosen largely uh, because it offered the opportunity to further develop the facility. The stage two progress up until 2017 included investments in geotech investigation, land acquisition and the preparation of the EA Sports Field Master Plan 2017, which was subsequently presented to the user groups. The vision for the centre was arrived at after considerable con consultation with user groups over many years, as some of you will be aware. So the community has already demonstrated for su support for the long-term vision for the facility down there. The project was then separated into two stages, mainly because, well, it was my view anyway, because by then the pool complex was well and truly long overdue and so the indoor uh, facility and associated pool were built. But during the final design and construction phase of that stage it was proposed that stage two would commence reasonably promptly after stage one was completed. However once stage one was completed stage two timeline was reset to a slightly longer time period and our understanding that was due to funding consideration. But our submission fundamentally is that the project as set out in the 2017 EA Sports Field Master Plan needs to stay in the current plan and that the Council must continue with urgency to progress the project as planned, albeit with further consultation with the community to finalise the specifics. This was always the intent for the facility to be a multi-sports hub for the town, not just an indoor sports hub. The hub also brings the opportunity to create a multifunctional community centre, similar to those reasonably, recently constructed by local councils in places like Dunsandal, Lincoln and Taitapu. And for those of you who have been there, they're wonderful community assets built around primarily a sporting use. While we understand there's been significant staff turnover at council, the last four years have seen no real visible action or engagement from council since that consultation and preparation of the sports field master plan and its subsequent presentation to users. So we believe there's now a really pressing need in the town for consolidation of sporting facilities. Now our written submission spoke about the footprint rugby has in the community but rugby clubs are also lead organisations in a number of combined uh, sports club facilities in the town. So we see the project as offering a solution to the rationalisation and modernisation of sports facilities in the township, and rugby as a sport can contribute significantly to this project. But I would uh, challenge the council here that the project actually needs ongoing leadership from council, not just from the community end. Council has a role in, in developing our community as a whole and supporting the many business as usual community activities, including sport, that go on at it on in our district every weekend is a key part of that. From our mid Canterbury Rugby's perspective, the showground is no longer fit for purpose and the ongoing incompatible use means annual remediation costs to return the grounds to sports 
use have become significant and will continue to be so given recent decisions by the AMP and associated horse groups to increase their usage of the, of the fields. <clears throat> As I said earlier, there is a pressing need for consolidation of several sp sporting facilities in the town and we believe that the will is there among the sporting groups to engage in that discussion. The EA Sports Field project <coughs> offers the opportunity to build a multi-generational, gender-neutral facility for outdoor sports and the community, and to complete the vision for the community sports hub to be based on the land that Council acquired for the purpose. Council received recently a grant from Central Government towards the new Council building, which had already been budgeted for, so perhaps this is an opportunity to reallocate at least some funds to this community project. But fundamentally we ask Council to review what is proposed in the draft plan and in fact accelerate stage 2 EA centre planning, not pause it, and to implement the vision and, and plan that was originally proposed as soon as practical. The project should remain in the LTP or a significant opportunity for sport in the community, in the town, over the next five to fifteen years will be lost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have some questions, if you're okay with that. Yep. Um, Neil. Thanks Ian for your submission, it's good. Um, in our last long-term plan we had um, some dollars in there budgeted and there was a five million dollar contribution from the community to go in there but the five million didn't come forward so um, hence nothing was really done I suppose you would say. So we got to this plan and um, we removed it to see if it was still um, needed and we got the reaction that we wanted and here you are today which is great and others submitting on it too. The talked about the showgrounds was a um, an opportunity short term short to medium term to, term to um, fix uh, this the problem but do you believe and you've had some discussions with the showgrounds and the, the horse people do you believe that's dead in the water or does it need some um, um, further interactions with other people? Um, that, yeah, you could argue that that might be worthwhile. I mean, history shows that it's been a very slow process, but, I mean, even the whole EA project itself was a long, long time in the gestation, so um, there's always challenges. I mean, to be fair to the AMP, I mean, they're, they're, they're accountable to their own members and they have their own member groups, and so the creation of a separate horse facility equestrian area was actually mooted back as early as 2009-10 and again 2015-16 so you know it might be a case of fourth time lucky I don't know but yeah I mean it's worth exploring I understand where you're coming from and I mean any project like this that we're talking about is not going to be uh, an overnight solution it's going to take time. Thank you Liz. Thank you um, thanks Ian. Um, just probably a question around some of the smaller clubs in Ashburton and what their views are on if we had one sort of central hub. I mean, I know on the weekend, on Saturday, there were three different club days, Rakaia, Southern and Methven, I think. Um, so there's a lot of kids out there um, playing rugby, but how are these smaller clubs going to view sort of having a central um, spot for their Saturday games? It's fair to say probably that we, and I think most club people who think about it, view that we've probably got too many clubs. And so the other thing is that, um, you know, given the size of facilities that many of them have, which were built many years ago around different membership bases, you know, it's, a, it's one of the challenges is, is for those combined clubs to, to you know, meet the expenses of um, a reduced uh, membership base. So... That is a challenge, but the proposal down there in terms of the rugby component was a premium field and one and possibly two um, training type fields which would meet our needs. But I suppose a good example of a place that I've been associated with in the past was Omaru, where there's two clubs based uh, on <coughs> Centennial Park, you know, and that and that that works reasonably well. So it, picking up on what Neil said, it's not just a matter of dealing with the likes of the AMP within our own organisations. You know, there's a little bit of water to pass under the bridge, but but I I am convinced that uh, there is a genuine will now to for people to work together to find a better solution. Okay, um, John, you'd have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your submission. Um, question I have is: Are you looking to base all mid cannery rugby at an enhanced EA network centre? Uh, by all of rugby, you mean all clubs or 
No, I don't think that it worked. Clearly, clearly the, the, the country clubs are, are ticking along reasonably well, although maybe not performance-wise at the moment because I'm a bit suspect. But, but generally, uh, they're, they're quite strong and they're, they're centres of their local community. There is, there is though, a, a difficulty in town uh, with the number of clubs and the number of facilities and the sustainabilities of, uh, of those. See, the issue I see down there, the more that we develop EA Network Centre, we're going to have a greater parking problem. Mm -hmm. There already is a huge parking problem there at the moment, which leads on to health and safety issues. Yeah, I mean, I was, I, that's something to do with the facility, but I mean, I would, I would argue that if you go and look at the road sides around a lot of the rugby venues on a Saturday, I'm, I'm equally concerned about the ongoing safety health and safety aspects of that. So. Okay, um, we have one last question, please. Lane, for Ian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ian, just, just a question. Um, there's only three fields being planned up here, if it ever happens. How do you see that to share it with other sports? Because everyone else wants to be there. How are we going to work this? Or you only see it for rugby itself? No, no, it has to be a multi-sport facility. It just doesn't work on its oh. own. Yeah, so... Okay. I mean, it would be just like the stadium itself. I, I imagine there'd just need to be some rostered time. I mean, clearly, the, one of the arguments of building a premium field, that would that would be there for premium events. So if it was built to a specification where football was able to be played, then, you know, if they had a feature game. I mean, our draw is normally done, this year's an exception, but our draw, national draw is done, you know, November, December, January. So there's a bit of uh, forward planning. And if there was specific issues on a specific day, it's been proven in the past, we can on occasion play elsewhere, we can get relief from NZR to do that. So, no, we, I mean, if we're going into a facility like this, you would be, you, you have to share it with other people. It's not a sole use exercise. And you think that it's an option? Yes, yep. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ian, for your submission and for talking to it this afternoon. Thank we you. appreciate your time, thank you. Um, I think now we have a, <coughs> are you here, Clark, to represent New Zealand, the netball? Uh, Mid Canterbury netball, yeah. Mid Canterbury netball, yes. Um, welcome, Clark McLeod, to represent Mid Canterbury netball. Thank you for your submission. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Um, just by the way of background, um, I've been uh, involved in sports administration on and off for the, for the past 20 years. Um, here locally in the Spurden district and um, also in the, um, the Christchurch area. Um, also, my background is, uh, is really rugby um, and with Crusader Rugby, um, started with Hamish down there. Um, so I was involved in that for a few years before um, being involved in uh, overseas organisations. So I find myself um, on the Mid Canterbury Netball uh, Board. So. It's a wee bit uncharted territory for me, and um, uh, I've only just sort of started this role and, and really enjoying it because uh, I've actually learnt a lot, uh, particularly when it comes to the submission. So I've been asked to speak on this and uh, have found a wee bit of uh, background out about the sport and the uh, and the facility. So um, yeah, Mid, Mid Canterbury um, yeah, would like to object to the proposal to uh, pause and maybe reschedule the long term planned funding for the EA Network Centre, and I'll get to my reasons for that uh, shortly. But, um, you know, I, I didn't, haven't, sorry, I didn't hear what uh, M. Patterson was saying previously, but just caught the tail end of it. But uh, knowing the history of the development of the site, uh, I was obviously built for um, uh, a long-term plan for, for multi-sports, and there's been a lot of uh, time and effort in, in terms of the site selection and, uh, and getting more more grounds and, and the ability to to expand um, the the clubs that are involved down there uh, were sold the idea that it was uh, um, uh, going to be a sports sports hub uh, with you know uh, potential growth and I, I can't uh, quantify whether um, some of the planning around the actual EA network stadium itself but I understand it was uh, proposed to be a four court uh, through to a six court and there was also going to be some gym expansion um, but that, that I'm not uh, familiar with but um, and it's really a great asset and I never knew the uh, the demand uh, was so, so great. My personal uh, experience with the facility uh, I've got a, 
uh, nine and seven year old uh, children and they um, predominantly used it all through the uh, swimming pool etc and now that they've um, they're coming through they're starting to use the court facilities and my uh, girl had her first game of netball on uh, Friday night and um, as soon as the, the game was finished in with the next lot of sport so I was absolutely um, surprised with that so um, the facility between five and nine is uh, understand is, is solidly booked. So um, yeah, is that that's it's peak time, so it's at its absolute capacity and it's very well used between three and five, sort of the, the, the school times. And uh, also understand that you know there's a few one-off events in there. So great community asset, well done, and it's getting it couldn't get any more use than it really really is. So the challenges that um, Mid Canterbury Net will have is the competition is limited uh, to to 24 uh, teams. They they do not. This is in a, in a social grade. Uh, they they do not have capacity to have any more uh, teams involved. And I thought, well, you know, what about the op the opportunity of actually splitting it over a couple of nights? And um, uh, again, because the, because the facility is fully booked, there's just not the scope uh, to do that. Um, the, some of the other uh, challenges is uh, there's not sufficient space for all teams to, to train and um, some teams will use half a, half a court to be able to uh, for train to their facilities. Um, and then some competitions are um, interrupted for the one-off events so that, uh, again it's just a booking capacity issue. So yeah, so those are the challenges, and they really just fit around the um, the high demand for the facility. So uh, hence why uh, you know sort of looking at the resourcing uh, of the facility for, for further further growth. And I have touched on um, the widening uh, sporting community, where uh, I'm involved in some clubs around town, and um, yeah, I know that they are actively um, uh, there's conversations around uh, whether it be consolidation but there is um, some real structural changes that are uh, potentially needed so uh, the, yeah, the memberships um, are dropping um, and into the, the contrary of um, the netball so since the stadium facility has been there for netball uh, the memberships have really grown and so the competition is growing and now the limited on the capacity and just to give you some ideas of numbers uh, so there's 1500 uh, current players 230 umpires each week 120 coaches 19 uh, clubs and schools and five representatives teams thousands of supporters a week and thousands of, of volunteers um, so when you come back to the um, the wider sporting group, um, there's it's like it's an opportunity uh, now because these clubs are looking at a little bit of direction, and the committees that they have, they've got sports administrators there, and I feel they actually need um, they need council support in terms of you know what that step may be because that these committees can't in my view, make that structural decision. I think there needs a lot of support uh, for that. So in, in summary, um, I think uh, the problems that mid county Netball have are great problems to have because obviously with the high demand for the existing EA Network Centre. Um, and then if you look at the structural uh, challenges which are in the wider community, see that the, the solution really sits with the implementation of the master plan and the resources to be allocated to the facility. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. Um, does anybody have any questions to the submitter? Lynette. Just going to ask about the outside courts. Are they mm. being used regularly or like if down the line we could just put a roof over them with the outsides, would they be more useful to you or, or what do you expect down there? Um, yeah, I, I probably can't answer that one uh, directly. Um, I couldn't even tell you if they've got actually lights on them uh, myself. Um, yeah, but obviously the, the indoor courts are a superior uh, surface and, and all weather. I've, I've only been uh, involved with Mid Canterbury Netball for 
six weeks. <laughs> Stuart, you have a question. Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. Perhaps it's unfair to ask you this question too. If two or three years ago, we proposed that netballers play about extra 50 cents a week or something, and there was an awful hue and cry. The ratepayer are putting 3.5 or 6 million a year subsidising that facility. Would your organisation be prepared, if we did extend it, to actually contribute a little bit more towards it? I mean, it was going to be a cup of coffee a week extra, and they were out of their trees over it. Um, I think if people want to extend it, they have to be prepared to front up. Do you think the netballers would be prepared to pay a bit more so that we could extend it? I, I think that's reasonable. Thank you. Neil? Yeah, my question is along the same line as Stuart's. Um, they did jump up and down a couple of years ago when we tried to do that. But um, and the rate payer contributes six, six to about two thirds of the dollars into that facility. It's over, just over $4 million they put in. So. Um, the users obviously put in $2 million, which is which is fine, which we agreed. They're never going to be self-supporting. So um, if they were happy to, if we did develop, if they were happy to pay a bit more, that would be a good solution, I think. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, one last question from J John Falloon for you, if you don't mind waiting around. Bye. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for your submission. question I have is, basically, prior to EA Networks being opened, all netball was played outside. Therefore, why do we have to play everything indoor? Why can't some grades resume playing outside? Good, good question. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I can't, uh, you know, fully answer that. Um, but I think the the netball is just one aspect to the facility, and um, I think you need to look at the global picture, uh, John, around that. So. If uh, yeah, netball's one piece of, say, if you put another two courts in, uh, it, it will create um, greater opportunity for more tournaments, regional tournaments uh, in Ashburton. It would also create greater opportunities for other events to be held at the facility. Um, so to answer your question, uh, for the players, I will use they probably could, but if you also had the facility there, it would be well, it would be well used. Thank you very much. Oh, one further, qu last question, Lane. Snap it under the wire. Just a question. How much time is spent in the A Centre with netball during the year? Is it just a couple of months, like through the winter, or is the whole year, three uh, days a week? Quite, yeah, quite, it's, it's quite a portion. Um, I think, you know, um, from, and as I say, I'm just still getting the grounds with, uh, with netball, but it's from February to September, and there's there's multiple competitions, so it's not one competition. You've got rep competitions, club competitions, social competitions. You have um, uh, other wee formats uh, of the game as well, uh, which have, have developed. So, yeah, it's, it, it is servicing the community in a, in a, in a wide concept. Um, yes, netball doesn't have the same uh, commercial capability as, as rugby, but uh, it is a big part of our community. Thank you very much, Clive, for your submission. Okay. And we'll get back to you in due course. Yep. Um, I would now like to invite Jan Cochran from Sport Canterbury, please. Welcome, Jan, and you have Hi. somebody accompanying you. <laughs> yeah. I do, I need a man. <laughs> uh, like to, um, thank you and um, for having us here today. And I'd like to introduce Sean Campbell, who is the um, part of the senior team for Sport Canterbury, Welcome, Sean. Um, sure. based in uh, South Canterbury. So I guess I'm really here now to reiterate everything that has been said by Mid Canterbury Netball and Mid Canterbury Rugby. Um, to begin with, parks and faci community facilities are important to the life and well-being of our people. Facilities bring residents together and help create the sense of community that defines a place. That, that first paragraph in my initial um, public service part of the submission it is really important to an area like Ashburton. I think we've seen a huge growth in our population across multiculture and um, to create that sense of community. We're working really hard, just not with sport, but um, even with our welcoming communities um, group that I am part of the advisory group. So 
um, it has widened my views and, and rather than just sport, it's about active recreation and play. Um, the two prior to me also discussed the um, 2017 um, master plan that was produced and I agree that we haven't really seen a lot go forward from that. But the reason we are here today is to just when reading this um, draft long-term plan about the words paused and maybe it is a concern. Um, I think no matter what happens while, while we go forward through this community that we should be ongoing. It's not about pausing. Um, no matter what we find statistically, data, it is still part of a project and EA Networks is part of this community. Um, when the site was identified and then obviously consequently it was built on, there was a vision to see that as a big sporting hub, which are the most successful um, areas in, in our country, in New Zealand, to um, develop. And if we don't keep it as part of our ongoing projects, it, it could actually go backwards. So um, obviously the uh, networks has definitely um, seen its value. Um, through across many areas and it could actually be wider um, with the extension of the two courts. Just going back to one of the comments, and now I've forgotten which councillor asked about the end wall, it may have been councillor Lover, um, that when the stadium was built, um, the end wall could go out over, be pushed out and then the sides and that part of the roof come in. So that was one question there. And that was basically spoke about as being in the next four to five years. We're now hitting six years in the EA networks. Um, and, and on that too, the outside courts are used regularly. If they're not used just to play out there, they are used as warm-up games and therefore you're, you're taking players that are out there then they run along um, and to go inside, so you're talking about work and, and what they're carrying in from outside. Um, a community is in an area where we are really looking at a lot of play. Now that sounds um, probably new terms for you people, but over the last three months we have set up with YMCA a really positive relationship um, developed through Tamanawa funding and one of the really um, amazing outcomes that we now have that it's to be extended is our what we call community pop-ups. They have based themselves in Freelander Park um, on the Tuesday and then on a Thursday at the Domain and our numbers have been significant. I, I was part of that and I I wasn't sure how it would go. Um, it was, but came on the back of what they were doing in South Canterbury, and I have to say the people that have attended them are the ones that are just playing. They put out a whole lot of um, equipment, and so it just shows you that people will be there if we put it in front of them. They do use it, so that's been a really good um, area of of play that is needed in our community. So to have an area set up there which wouldn't take a lot in one place would be great. So why, why parents taking their children swimming or, um, as Clark said, in, into the indoor stadium for netball, basketball, um, they can go out, the others can go out there and play. It, it's been significant. So I'd like to see that. From extension of uh, Mid Canterbury Rugby, um, that was a huge um, factor in, in their drive for the A Networks um, initially and um, really do support that that moves forward as well. And there was discussion at the time, Councillor Brahm, about the, the turf, and I, I'm not up with that, but the turf being able to be used for multi, and they did discuss the football and the rugby being able to use the same ground. Um, I guess uh, for going on to the extension of the courts too is that we do see our regular users if there is an event in town, e.g. our indoor bowls that was held here um, 18 months ago, it actually took out all regular users for over um, a week while they set up, they played the competition and then took it down. So. There is an opportunity, some of the sports could continue um, at what level, maybe Premier, maybe the Juniors, but it could continue if we had that extra court space. Um, and currently now, yes, there is a downtime, and I totally um, recognise that through um, 
we, we have to develop programs that are held during the day, but from 3.30 to 9.15 when it closes, it is full packed most nights of the week. And there's, there are teams that cannot train in there because of it. Um, a lot of the netballers are actually using half court. So there's already, yes, they split the cost, but actually um, I'm often invited in to take coaching sessions in netball. And it frustrates me to think I've got to get in there and use half a court. Um, it, it takes up my time as far as I'd rather do a full court, but that's one question I asked, and that's half a court. Um, so it would be great. We have a regional events fund that, that is administered by council currently, and what we're doing is asking for events to come in. That's great. Well, on one hand, we're asking events to come in, but then if they come into the stadium, then we are, we are upsetting the regular users as well. So we just have to be mindful of that. Um, with an extension, it would be able to <coughs> overcome some of those major obstacles for regular users. Um, I guess the third part was the infrastructure services. Um, that, you know, just when planning, whether it's your roading or um, new areas, new subdivisions, to ensure that there are safe and wider pathways for cyclists, scooters, they're out there. Um, but it is pretty limited for some, and in some cases quite dangerous if you get scooters or cyclists. So just make sure in planning that I ask Council to address the, the need to make a healthy, active community by encouraging walking and cycling and those other areas of um, scooters. Um, I guess it's all about connecting our, our communities and our um, facilities like schools to the EA networks or schools to schools, schools to the domain, um, just when planning going forward. Um, and lastly, I uh, have been fortunate enough to be part of the Safer Communities Programme in Mid Canterbury, so Safer Mid Canterbury. Um, I really support their um, submission to keep that going. I, if anything, I have a criticism, and that is that we um, have a person employed, and she's only part-time, and how she gets through that role in that time, I do not know. It has been an amazing um, group to be part of, and we have certainly achieved a lot. Uh, Sport Canterbury were involved in the falls prevention side, and we've certainly um, achieved the outcomes we expected, but there could be a lot more, and we rely a lot on the uh, leadership of the person to lead that in a part-time role. So that's from that one, and the other one was that the um, success that has already happened with our Citizens Advice Bureau through their submission and what they have achieved. Uh, Sport Canterbury obviously acknowledges what uh, the council do in support of, of our trust, um, and we work very hard to ensure that we provide the outcomes that you expect of us. Um, and going forward, we look forward to working with you continuously. Um, but there is a lot of work. Uh, going back to Clark, uh, I am leading a group of two clubs currently that do want to amalgamate and would like to actually vision is to, to move into the um, area if there is an outside opportunity and to create a new club. So that is to begin from next week. So there is a shift in governance in some of our sports, and um, who knows if we could have that. It would certainly grow, but bring quality as well. Thank you, Jane. Um, Sean, do you have anything to add quickly? We yeah, just, just um, well, firstly, thank you for having me and allowing Jane to bring along a friend, I guess. Um, just in regards to, I guess, the submission, there's a um, significant amount there around, I guess, spaces and places or infrastructure and, and facilities. Um, so I guess as an organisation, we're using our um, spaces and places resource quite differently. Um, so if you do have uh, opportunities for projects, if you can understand the, the scope uh, the outcomes you want and the time frames around them. I would encourage you to sort of work through Jan or myself um, to put them into the mix because it's something we're looking to invest some dollars and, and money in as well and, and maybe help engage with the right consultants to get those works done and, and make some really um, sound planning and assist with your decision making as well with um, with infrastructure going forward. Um, and obviously we, we look at it through, I guess, um, a bigger lens than just the Ashburton district would probably take a whole of Sport Canterbury 
um, view to some of those those okay. planning decisions and, okay. and things. So just that, that opportunity is there as well. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody have a... Oh, Lane, you have a burning question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, we had three submitters now talking about the same area, <coughs> what is great. But I've just been counting up. So the minimum you want, two extra courts, through three sport fields outside, an extended car park and a pop-up area. I think it's all under negotiation. Yes, the extension. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But the extension of the two courts is because that's why those that two outside courts were built as they are for that very reason. That was in the planning, the original planning, and that was a decision to move that forward. So that, that for us, that's why we said two courts. If you want to build four, that's fine. Um, but as far as the outside area, that is something that we need to consult with all our groups. Why you are talking about the rugby? Yes, they were initial, very strong going forward to the EA Networks facility, um, and they were going to be in the second stage. But it won't be just rugby, there could be other sports that, well, there have been sports showing other interests to go down there. Should the hockey have a second turf, they'd really like to bring it down to that area. So it's actually about keeping consultation going with all the community sporting groups as well as organisations to build in that area down there. I mean, there's, there was discussion one time with the, and I don't know, but the overarch that building, it looks like a hangar, that maybe the climbing wall go in there and stop so it didn't interfere with courts space. Um, there's been lots of talk. We just need to keep that moving forward. Um, and I do acknowledge that Steve Favish, since he's been here, has, has um, really brought user groups to ensure that that happens. We just need to keep it going. And that's why the word paused or maybe is quite strong in our words. We'd like to keep it as an ongoing project. Thank, Thank you. you very much. One more oh. question if I can, please. Just, just the, the two extra courts who are there, what could be just covered. It's still hot mix. Oh. Is there also a new fo floor to go in or not? Or you play on the hot mix floor? Obviously we'd love the, the floor. Um, that would be ideal. Uh, and that was what was in part but of the original okay, plan. Yeah. Yes, okay. it was. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you, for presenting. Jan, Jan and Sean. Um, and we'll get back to you in due course. I'd now like councillors to turn to page 416. We have James Reid here to present on behalf of Mountain Bike Ashburton. Welcome James. Thank you, uh, thanks for having me. I'm James from Mountain Bike Ashburton and you'll hopefully remember I presented at the hearing for the walking and cycling strategy. Yeah. Uh, I'm here today with a similar message after attending a meeting between Council and the Ashburton Hackettree River Trail Committee and learning that there's a distinct possibility that this council and newly appointed staff have no intention of continuing to provide support for walking, cycling, motorbike, horse riding and for all drive tracks. Uh, this committee is made up of volunteer groups that create and maintain these tracks and was founded by and supported by this council and its staff for many years. Even when its budget was removed by councillors, the previous open spaces manager understood the value of these assets that our groups provide for the community and continued to support us as much as possible. It's surprising and incredibly disappointing to us uh, and much of the community that there is now no support for the Ashburton Hackettree River Trail Committee. I'd like to acknowledge the support we have received through two community grants in the past. While they were appreciated, they are simply not enough support and the rules do not allow us to uh, spend the money as we see best fit. Some comments that were made by councillors present today before and after my submission of the cycling and walking strategy that I'd like to address. So Mountain Bike Britain has never asked this council to take over full-time maintenance of the walking or cycling tracks. We're simply asking council to provide a small amount of assistance similar to as you have provided um, over the last 10 years until recently and much like provided by ECAN and many local businesses. The walking and cycling tracks we have created are not exclusively on ECAN land. In fact, about 40% of the area is district council land. We and other groups that make up the Ashburton Hackettree River Trail Committee are not just creating new tracks as we please without permission. New developments have always been planned with transparency and proactive communications with the Open Spaces Department because we want council to be involved. Uh, our tracks and facilities are not just targeted at cycling enthusiasts. We welcome you to go out and experience the tracks for yourself to learn this. 
Over a course of any given day, you observe morning runners, followed by groups of walkers, people cycling to work, kids using the skills park, young families getting exercise, as well as competitive cyclists. Our club exists and holds competitive events for its more serious members, but generally on the track, this group is the minority. So if we wind back the clock 10 years, there was a time when council staff were proud to be involved in the construction of walking and cycling tracks alongside the river. The open spaces manager at the time spoke of it as a community project that council were driving and accepted help from many other groups, but always made sure it was this council who had their name on it. These days, the Hecketree River Trail groups are largely on their own and struggling with the growing demand. This is especially apparent, apparent for us, where we have numbers of walkers and runners increasing so much so that we've invested over $20,000 in a separate track for them. That's a track that we don't even use. A track that we think council should have paid for, like most other district councils uh, around the country are doing. In fact, most district councils are not only paying for walking and cycling tracks, they're also helping to fund the off-road cycling tracks, like our one, because they understand the positive effects these assets have for the community. I recently read about your short-term commitment to build a children's skills park in the domain. And while we're not necessarily against this, it's surprising to us to see you would commit such a large amount of funding towards a project that will likely have a lot fewer children using it than our skills park, which was developed entirely by us and received no funding from, from the council anyway. Uh, so what makes what we're doing different to other sporting groups around the district? Well, walking and cycling trails that we've created can be used any time and any weather and by any people of any ability. The river trail is inclusive of the whole community you don't need a lot of money, you don't need a lot of gear, and you don't need to arrive at a particular time or bring a team. Uh, I, could, I could be wrong, but it sounds like from some of the other submissions, uh, Council's already contributing to uh, other sports groups. And I would say that walking and cycling, while not competitively but socially, is probably the biggest uh, the sport that influences the most people in this community. I'd like to finish by asking this. Has the community decided they no longer want their rates contributing to the great assets along the Ashburn River? Or has the group of representatives in this room stopped listening to what the community wants? We're not asking for a lot. It's a drop in the ocean comparatively. But I can guarantee that adequate funding, combined with a proactive relationship between us and the council, will go a long way to giving the community and the ratepayers what they want. And we look forward to having you come on board. Thank you very much for your submission, James. And for the written submission, um, I think Neil has a question for you. Yeah, I've got a couple of you go, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. James, the, you talk about there's no support from council staff. So where did that come from? Uh, so I think it was 2010 to 2013, there was $25,000 budget for that term uh, that went, went to the committee. Uh, there's also 40000 for capital projects. Uh, th and then that was discontinued, yeah, 2013 or something. But since then, uh, under David Askin, he, he was supporting us from open spaces. You were, um, but lately you've got support from staff? Oh, uh, no. Not, 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 not really, no. Right. Um, how many dollars are needed? You haven't got a dollar figure in here. Uh, what are you requesting? 40,000 is what we suggest. 40. And your tracks, would you ever seal them? Would they need to be sealed at all or just leave them as gravel? Uh, no, we wouldn't seal them. Why wouldn't you seal them? Uh, the off-road the off tracks, they're, uh, yeah, they're not footpaths. You guys have plenty, plenty of footpaths and paved trails around. We're doing something different. Thank you. And your skills park, I think the one at the main was to teach young children to stop starts like, um, on mimicking a road. Is your skills park the same as that, or is it different? Uh, it does have some very basic skills. Uh, yours would probably be more basic, and yeah, I think it's a good idea, but we're just, as a comparison... Uh, you've, that's probably going to be quite costly. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Liz, that, you'd like to ask a question? Yeah, that was my question as well. So your skills park, I think the idea of the one in the domain is for children to learn about road safety and when to stop it, stop signs, etc. Is that Could you incorporate that into your skills park? At, or, or, I'm guessing they're really different. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely consider it, yeah. Which, okay. Thank you. Um, and then I have, Lane, you have a question for James? Two, okay. Two yep. questions. Just the, the track you talked about you developed, but you don't use it because it's for people walking. Where's that? Which one is that? Uh, so between, you can walk from Melrose and mm -hmm. 
very shortly you better come out at the State Highway 1 bridge completely separate to the cycle track. Okay. That'll be finished in a couple of months time. Okay. And the other question was $40,000, is that per year you want to have? Or yeah, is it once? annually. Yeah. Annually. Okay. Thank you. Um, Larry, you have an additional question? Just, just one. That track you talk about, the walking one you just talked about, finished shortly. Who did you discuss with for putting that in? Uh, ECAN, uh, this council, and some private landowners. They'll be all the staff though, because we don't know about it as council. Uh, as a property team, we've got a license to occupy where it's uh, all drawn out and mapped. Yep. Thank you very much, James, for your great submission. And we'll take, as mentioned, other people will take that on board and Thank get you. back to you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite people now to turn to page 394 and invite Steve Adam up from the Mid Canterbury Four Wheel Drive Club, please. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for your submission. Thank you. Right, as, as uh, Madam Chair has just mentioned, I represent the uh, Mid Canterbury Four Before Club and as part of the uh, Hextree River Trail Committee also. Um, I'd just like to talk more a little bit about the, the River Trail as, as, a, as a recreational resource. You know, it's grown from its inception, as, as uh, James just mentioned before, by very, uh, a lot of uh, volunteer groups, the Ashburton District Council, Environment Canterbury as a walking and, and cycling trail. Mm -hmm. But now it's grown into a multi-use um, environment for... Um, recreational use uh, and it's around horse trekking, um, motorbikes and four wheel drives is also, we've got separate areas there. And I'd just, I just uh, like to talk about the, the Ashburton District Council and their support as uh, the previous submitter talked about. Uh, the support seems to have waned in the last few years, uh, particularly in the last two years and uh, it's pretty hard on the volunteer groups when they're, they're looking for, for support. Uh, and, and it's not just in financial support, but also in, in advice and that sort of thing as well. So, you know, the Hecatree River Trail now boasts the mountain bike um, skills um, park, the bike trails, multiple walking and running trails, horse trekking, motorbike track, and in recent addition was the Mid Canterbury Four Before um, uh, Park, which was um, at the blessing, blessing of, of Environment Canterbury. Um, Everything's, all the maintenance and construction has been done by an awful lot of volunteers, by all the different groups as well, you know, putting in a lot of time in the upkeep of the trail. Again, support from ECAN and, and not a lot from Ashburn District Council. So what I'm looking for in my submission is, is, is the support um, and more being recognised in the, in the long-term plan as a recreational zone. Um, that provides all sorts of, of, of recreation. So looking for funding and, and physical support. So that's my submission. Thank you very much. Um, Steve, do we have any questions for Steve? Neil? Yes, um, Steve, if you get support from ECAN, what sort of support do you get from them? Um, they provide um, things like weed spray, um, Advice on on um, planting of, of trees and, and and looking after waterways and the, and the likes, and the support you want from council. What support do you want from council? Is 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 kind of the the committee the, the river trail committee was was formed as part of the council in terms of of um, that support, and we really want that well established. And does it have a dollar figure, or is it just in um, kind? Oh, that's tempting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think what James talked about is forty thousand a year is, is sufficient to for for maintenance and and uh, and general support. Yes. It'd be the same forty thousand. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John, you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for your submission. Um, question I have is, where is the four-wheel drive part well, of the track? Well hidden. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's down on the end of uh, Cochrane's Road. So we've got a form track there, and it goes way off into the trees there, and as you're walking, if you're walking down the walking track, you hardly even know it's there. Elaine. No, no same question, sorry. Thank you. 
As an incidental thing, we've got a, a big event there. It's the last um, event on the Wheels Week calendar uh, this coming Sunday, and we're expecting probably in excess of 100 four-wheel drives down there, plus spectators and everything as well. So, you know, it's 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 not a small park and not that. It's, it's pretty yeah. good. Thank you very much for your submission, Steve. We appreciate it and all the best. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to invite Ashley Shah up to present on his submission. Welcome, Ash. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for attending. Um, floor's yours. Oh, we're on page, councillors. We're on page 524. I'll just wait for my handout to all the people. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present at the submission. I would like to talk about drinking water standards, Adler D pension housing, second bridge, and ADC rates. So I'll start with drinking water matter, uh, meters. I support the installation of water meters at every household in the district to measure the, and restrict the water wastage. But the question is how the council has arrived at an estimate that 50% of water is wasted. And if so, why those assumptions were not published? Second is, is the council going to set a limit over which the water rates will be applied? Like, I forgot to add, 2,000 liter per day would be free or something like that. Has the council looked into the option that every household should have water filters enabling good drinking water? If so, that would save thousands of ratepayers money and the same money can be used elsewhere. Elderly pension housing. In my opinion, the cost should be spread. The council has admitted in long-term draft plan under, under spending on maintenance. Hence, we are facing this issue at the moment. Can the council do better in providing these facilities at more cost-effective manner and assume that the proper maintenance is carried out every year? Three water reforms. It's quite a long document. I have printed off internet and some FAQ questions. It says that under FAQ published by government in point number seven, the government is to provide 50% payment upfront of their allocation. Question is, how much is ADC going to receive? And if so, has the amount budgeted in the draft plan? What and how is council going to address the $30 million fund to the, uh, for rural supplies? And again, how much is going ADC going to receive that? Are those reforms going to create new layer of bureaucracy? Second bridge. The need for second bridge is more important to NZTA than us. Can the council exercise more pressure on NZTA so we, the ratepayers, can only pay up to 10% of its cost? And the lastly is the ADC rates. I know we have the best people employed for ADC staff and a very good elected councillors. Can you all assure that due and reasonable care has been taken to keep the rates increased to minimum? We all are going through COVID-19 and has put a lot of economic pressure on the household and our farmers. Can ADC demonstrate better management of our rates intake? Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. I appreciate your submission. Um, Neil has a question for you. Yeah, thanks, Ash, for your submission. There's lots of questions there, and we do have answers to all of them, so we, I don't think we need to give them to you right now, but there is answers for all of them. But there is one on Three Waters Reform Program. You talk about the 50% payment up front. I think that's for the um, Tranche 1 money, which you're talking about, where we got, <coughs> oh, uh, we're allocated $8 million from government, and we're doing some work on our uh, sewer pipes with that. $4 million is half of it and the other $4 million comes later, yes, we will get full $8 million for that. So based on $8 million, I think that, that money was provided for drinking water standards, and we are using for sewer maintenance, correct? It, it could be used on any of the three waters. There's drinking water, wastewater, stormwater. It was so it's a part of three, re three water reform programs? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Tranche one money, they called it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And the answers to the others, I don't he wants to give them there, but we do have answers for all those questions for you. Where can I find it, sir? Sorry? Where can I find those answers? Uh, we will give them to you through the um, 
Sub when we were in process. Yeah. All right, okay. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Lane, you have a question for Ash? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Ash, just a question. You know, the second bridge, you reckon it's not that important for us. Or which side of the bridge are you living? The south side or the north side? Mm -hmm. I honestly don't know where this. I I would leave to uh, to the experts to find out where no, 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 the bit. Where on which side of the river are you living? On the south side or on the north? I'm side? leaving Ellington. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Stuart. You Thanks, Carolyn. Ash, my question is regarding why did you say every household should have water meters? Our water is perfectly. Um, Council supplied water is perfectly good without water meters. Filters. filters. Well, I mean water filters. Yeah, why would you say water filters? Because we are spending too much money as per our budget to make sure that we are going to get in, and even the government is doing all the initiative that we at every household should have better quality drinking water. And that is also one of the main reasons for the three water reform where millions of dollars the council is budgeting to spend on it. So it's my humble opinion and common sense dictate that if we install uh, water filters at our every household, we would all have good drinking water. Why every water <laughs> that comes through the sky or through our uh, water schemes has to be filtered? I don't understand that. What you mean is over filters over the whole of New Zealand, not just Ashburton, because Ashburton water doesn't need filters on it. I think you are getting confused, or I am now. <laughs> Any further questions for Ash? Thank you very much, Ash. Thank you for your submission and for presenting it in person. It's much Thank appreciated. You much. Thank you. Um, if I can ask councillors and staff to turn to page 465, and I'd like to invite Selwyn Price up to speak to his submission. Welcome, Selwyn. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. I'll just hand these out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. The floor's yours, Selwyn. Thank you. Kia ora koutou katoa. Um, I've submitted on both the long-term plan and on community engagement policy, so I'll speak to both of them briefly. Um, on the community engagement policy, Council is to be commended for producing a policy, state, a policy document that finally recognises one of the three official languages of Aotearoa New Zealand. I do recall not so long ago when I had to fight to keep one single word of Te Reo into a policy document. Um, I'm heartened that Māori are recognised in this document as mana whenua, and it's reassuring that Hakateri Marae Committee is finally recognised as being worthy of engagement on matters of social wellbeing in the district. It's a pity that no mention is made of other significant ethnic groups um, who form a a large part of our community, um, and how ADC proposes to engage with them despite, despite employing a welcoming communities officer. I have concerns around the front page test and the social media test, um, neither of which could be described as being objective, and both of which have the potential to be open to manipulation as we've seen in the past. Um, my real concern, however, lies with some of the trigger points in respect to drinking water, wastewater and transportation. So to give you an example, uh, you may wish to keep the, the newly completed CBD um, roads, but you might choose to get rid of the rest of the roading network in the district. From my reading of this policy, that would not trigger public consultation or community engagement. Um, so maybe that needs looking at. Uh, that said, perhaps we should sell off the roading network. Um, we spend millions on it every year, yet it always rates poorly in the annual residence survey. 
perhaps we should stop rating for roads and and let the perhaps a residence cooperative operate to maintain them and then you'd do without all that whinging <laughs> imagine life without roading problems in terms of the long-term plan um, my comments here could be categorized as falling under three headings trust denial and attracting visitors and investment so in terms of trust local government operates on a trust basis the people of the district elect the council every three years with the expectation that they will do what is best for the district. This means taking into consideration, amongst many other things, cultural, economic, environmental and social factors, abiding by the appropriate legislation, and if you did so, you would be following the first point, and council's own policies, and considering all sectors of the community. The LP, LTP, this draft LTP, but betrays that trust in a number of ways, and I just want to highlight a couple of them for you. So if we look at the issue of water meters, <coughs> it states we could be losing up to 50% of our water from the system. And it's such a vague statement that it's virtually meaningless. That could mean anything from a single dripping tap, or it could mean losing thousands of Cumex per day. We don't know from reading the LTP. Uh, and not only that, but you've made that assertion without backing it up with any citation of any study, any research, anything, any evidence. In my view, the vast majority of any perceived loss would be detected by water meters placed on the trunk and reticulation mains and not on service connections. And surely a renewal program of all mains, such as you've been carrying out over the last several years, will alleviate the worst of the water leaks and therefore alleviate the need or cost of water meters to individual households. A further consideration also needs to be given to those service connections that already have water meters. And let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, I had to call ACL out to uncover a toby box that had been sealed over when the footpath was sealed. Um, when they had dug the hole and found the toby box, they actually fitted a water meter at no cost to me. Um, that household now has a water meter. Would that household therefore be exempt from rates on that water meter? And do you have the information to be able to implement that? Or are they going to have to pay for a water meter that's already been installed? We do not, another quote from the LTP, we do not plan to charge for water in this draft 10 year plan, but the future funding of water will be reviewed in three years time. Now, if I was a betting man, and fortunately I'm not, I would put my house on the fact that in three years time, we will be charged for water reticulation. Once ratepayers have had the pleasure of paying for the infrastructure to enable that to happen. That is such a qualified statement in so many different ways. Uh, the second example is social housing, which you've also highlighted. Um, back in July last year, I think it was, this question went out for public cons consultation and a subsequent decision was apparently made. I'm totally at a loss to understand why we're again being consulted on this issue and no explanation that I can... I, can find in the draft LTP document. Equally puzzling, puzzling are the public housing price comparisons provided on page 21, which as presented is also largely meaningless. They are selective and no source is given for the information. This reminds me of when we were given information about council sizes when we were looking at representation review. It was selective, no source was cited, some of my former students provided information like that without citing sources, I would send them back to do it properly. Our community deserves better than this. This is, once again, making assertions with no evidence to back it up. At the hearing uh, preceding the apparent decision being made, and I'm assuming that decision was made, I commented on a newspaper article that had preempted the decision. 
and I was told by the hearing chair at the time that he'd been misquoted throughout the article. The subsequent decision, which was accurately depicted in the article, made it clear that that was not the case. Moving on to denial. Doing nothing or delaying dealing with an issue of global urgency has the same effect as denial of the issue. On the issue of climate change, this LTP has turned denial into an art form, understating the challenges and overstating the opportunities. It's a bit like Trump <laughs> overstating his value when he wants loans and understating that when it comes to paying taxes. We spend on our roads the equivalent of building a new library and civic centre every four years. We are obsessed with it. Uh, yet there's nothing in this LTP that talks about viable alternative transportation options. That's denial. It seems that this council has parked its climate change policy in the archive, never again to see the light of day. I see very little in this LTP that addresses concerns around reducing ADC's carbon footprint, and I wonder how many EVs there are in the fleet at the moment. Conversely, it seems we are going to find a ready market for the world's most expensive bananas. But fortunately, they'll be harvested by all those climate refugees who'll be flocking to our district from elsewhere in New Zealand and across the Pacific. Now is the time, in fact, it's well past the time, now is the time to employ a full-time biodiversity officer to create wetlands, and we did have the notion of creating wetlands to filter the stormwater before it goes, before it's uh, discharged directly into the river, uh, to keep the stock water races open, to provide biodiverse ecosystems across the district, which of course will help uh, with carbon emissions, and to role model clean energy use. I don't see any of that in there. The recent media frenzy over the district, uh, so moving on to attracting visitors and investment, the recent media frenzy over the district slogan highlights how poorly this district markets itself. That no one from council have pointed out that whatever it takes, a slogan that smacked of desperation before it was even adopted, had been superseded by a slightly more hopeful the district of choice for lifestyle and opportunity says everything about how little importance we place on attracting visitors and investment to our community. Instead, we invited ridicule and we got it in spades. I spent uh, a couple of hours chuckling away at one particular Facebook pay, uh, post by uh, a news talk um, host. Wide roads, narrow minds was just one of the hundreds of responses on social media and that was one of the few that could be repeated in this forum. Instead we need to be creative and follow the lead of other smaller communities than ours who have understood and embraced the multiple, multiple benefits of attracting visitors to their districts. We need to identify our point or points of difference and enhance them, attracting visitors and investment rather than turning away anyone from the other side of the rivers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Selwyn. Um, I was read your written submission, um, and I just have a question. I, I'm also very interested in the consultation approach. And I just have an, a, in consultation from the council to the community, what do you think is missing from our consultation approach, from the current consultation? Um, I actually think most of that policy is, is uh, to be welcomed, but, but I did have a concern, as I said, that the trigger point, I think, is set way too high before public are going to be, well, before there'd be any community engagement. I think those trigger points need to come down considerably. Okay. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Sowan? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Sowan. Thank you for your time. Sir. Thank you. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Angus, you had your light on. Beg your um, pardon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Price, um, who, how would you charge to keep the stock water races open to provide biodiverse ecosystems? In other words, who would pay for that to happen? 
uh, there will be still be plenty of landowners who wish to keep those stock water races open. That would allow, sorry Councillor Falloon, but I disagree. I've dealt with cases where they have been. Um, there have been, and you know, we're talking about a saving of 50,000 as, as I understand it. 50,000 for the, for the benefit that would be created by leaving them open and perhaps doing a lot more planting around them would actually be well worth the while, worthwhile, especially if you're going to start being charged for carbon emissions. And I'm, as a ratepayer, I'd be quite happily happy to suck up my share of that. Uh, Councillor Orson. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, Selwyn, you're critical of our spend on transportation and roads. Yep. What, how would you spend otherwise? People aren't satisfied and we've got most of our produce is shifted by roads. A lot of people live in the rural areas by roads. Yep. If, if we don't have roads, public transport's not really an alternative in rural areas. What, what do you suggest we do then? Uh, yep. So you, when you talk about roads, you're talking about rural roads, I take it. I would say that uh, there needs to be some way that those large users are actually paying the likes of Tallies, the likes of Fonterra. Fonterra, as I understand it, contribute probably zero to uh, ADC coffers. Um, you know, spending the equivalent of building a new library and civic centre, and, and you know, we all know how much we've gone through to get that for a building that's going to last well in excess of 50 years. Spending that every four years is just unsustainable. Yeah, but and, you know, maybe maybe rural people, you know, if you're driving a Fonterra truck, I don't think the odd pothole or a, or a stone in the middle of the road is going to make much difference to you. Maybe it needs less maintenance. But a, I, a supplementary, do it's we... It's not sustainable. Do we not get a 50% subsidy from NZTA towards our road who Fonterra and Tallies contribute with road user charge? Well, they do, but it's fairly minimal, isn't it, compared to the rates that they might pay if they were actually based here. Okay, thank you very much for your submission, Selwyn, and thank you for your time coming down to present. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, can, oh, can we please turn to page 206 and invite Don Church from Fluoride Free New Zealand to the table, please. Is he? Yeah. Welcome, Don. Thank you for attending. Yours, yes. There you go. Right. <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you, Mr. Mayor and councillors, for giving me an opportunity to to speak to the submission made by Fluoride Free New Zealand, of which I'm a member. I'm a member. For those who don't know me, my name is Don Church. I'm a fellow chartered accountant and a resident and taxpayer of Ashburton. What um, led to the submission was the government is moving the fluoride decision over to, to the Director General of Health and if you understand the pro-fluoridation pro stance of the Health Department this means mandatory fluoridation really to be honest The Department of Health has had a pro-fluoridation stance for 65 years, ever since fluoridation began in New Zealand. Now, <coughs> I'm aware that Council are probably secretly pleased that this hot potato of a subject is taken out of their hands, but I feel they do have a responsibility to protect the community with its democratic right to decide. And furthermore, fluoride will be costly to Council. When fluoridation ended in Ashburton in 2002, the potable water supply came from a gravity system all the way down from Green Street. 
<laughs> that's since been replaced by multiple wells, and it will be costly to fluoridate the individual wells and bring it into one line. It's very probable that the Health Department will grant a, a subsidy to cover the capital cost, but they will not cover your ongoing costs of fluoro materials, of monitoring, and of maintenance. And in that sense, I should warn you that fluoridation, fluoride is quite corrosive of metal pipes and fittings. When fluoride ended in Ashburton in 2002, the subject didn't quite go away. There's a lot of uh, agitation from the Department of Health, and in 2007, a binding referendum was held here. And the result was quite definitive. 55% did not want fluoridation, 45% did. And at the time, the current mayor, Mr. Pete O'Malley, who was pro-fluoridation, said that the result was a clear indication of the way people feel. Now, health department or health officials should be experts, but their strong bias has them ignoring their own data and denying recent, robust scientific studies that question their pro fluoride stance. And health officials have misled councils in the past. To give you two quick examples, uh, in the Waimairi district of Christchurch, that's over 70,000 people, they were promised a 90% reduction if they changed the fluoridate of water. And they did in 1965. 21 years later, it was found that there was no difference. Waimairi had the, exactly the same dental decay rates as Greater Christchurch, which was unfluoridated. So fluoridation came out in 1972. Similarly, even in Ashburton, in 2006, a health official advised council and the media that dental decay in Ashburton in children had increased by 20%, 25%, sorry, since fluoridation was removed in 2002. That, that forced me to use the Public Information or Disclosure of Information Act to get the real figures from the health board. And the real figures I've got, put into a schedule, I think you've got copies of them, but I'm not going to go through it now, but if you follow it, in 12-year-old children, over the period from 2002 to 2013, decay did not increase, it reduced. It reduced by 30%. And this is how you can be misled. So in, in the end, there are three questions you've got to consider. Fluoridation that is promoted to be helpful to teeth, is it harmful to other body tissues? And in the written submission, if you'd like to read that, not now, but I would like to think you have read it, you'll find there is robust and recent scientific studies that say there is a detrimental effect on other bodily tissues, especially neurologically, the brain. <coughs> There is a loss of seven IQ points with fluoridation in children. The second question is, if Ashburton was fluoridated, would it reduce decay? And the answer is simply look at the table that I've distributed. Decay came down without fluoridation. Decay stayed the same in Waimairi despite 21 years of fluoridation. Which re really leads to the last question, does the benefit, so-called, of fluoridation justify the neurological damage affecting child IQ? So in conclusion, I'm brief. 
the written submission requests council to stand up to government and demand that council does retain the right of decision on behalf of this community. And the last point is the written submission asks would council be open to joining a class action lawsuit with other councils against the uh, inevitable decision by the Director General of Health? Thank you. Thank you very much, Don. And I think Liz has a question for you. I do, thank you. Hello, Don. Just a question on um, the handout you gave us, and you've got the methvin numbers there. Now, when I've asked in the past about trying to find... Because the Methvin schools obviously don't just have students who live in the township, but have a lot of students who ca catch the bus to come in. So I was told that they could never give us an accurate um, amount or sort of reason, any data that was really accurate because they couldn't differentiate between the children who lived in the town and the children who lived out of the town and weren't on fluoridated water. So I was just wondering if those figures that you have there, are they from children who have who live in the township? No, the, the statistics are from the school dental survey, so it includes all children at school. And, and you're quite right, it includes county children. However, I warn you that you that uh, there's such a small number in the tally for methvin. It's on your sheet, on your sheet there that it's not indicative of anything. It, it, as soon as it goes against the principle of fluoridation, the health department's quick to say, "Ignore it. There's not enough numbers there," and that's fair comment actually. Thank you, Stuart. Do you have a question? Thanks, Carolyn. Afternoon, Don. You've always been a campaigner against fluoride. It confuses me that so many dental health professionals are in favour. I mean, <coughs> why is there such a divergence of opinion when the majority it seem to be say it's good? Why do they majority say it's good when there's a your your enthusiasm said it's not? It can't, yeah. Both can't be right. You're correct that most dentists are in favour of fluoridation, but not all. There are um, at least three very active dentists against fluoridation on fluoride-free New Zealand. And when they are asked this question, their answer is, but we were taught this way. We believed in what we were taught. Some of those uh, dentists on the fluoridation or fluoride free have changed from what they once believed and now they are actively campaigning against fluoridation. So I can't give you a better answer than that, but it's what they believe. The only but it is denied by the data. Have a look at the data I've given you. I can provide you and I have with me data for the whole of New Zealand broken down by region for 2019, that's the latest period that the Ministry of Health statistics are available. This is their statistics, and it shows you that the South Island in particular does the same whether it's fluoridated or unfluoridated. There's no, diff no real difference. And getting back to this is question on rural parts of Bethlehem, the Canterbury statistics cover the whole rural area as well, and they are very good. Canterbury being unfluoridated, apart from Methvin and Burnham military camp. Neil, you have a question for Don. Yeah, I'll have a couple there. Just um, brushing your teeth, the fluoride in that toothpaste, would that not be just as good? It's out of favour now. Is it? Mm. Um, when you buy fluoridated toothpaste, if you look at the packet, it's 1,000 parts per, milli per milligram, which is very dangerously strong. It would poison you if you swallowed it, and, and they're advised not to swallow it, but it does cause mottling of the teeth. 
And even Dr. Martin Lee, who is with the Canterbury District Health Board, a very strong pro-fluoro person, admits that his own children have got mottled teeth through using fluoridated toothpaste. So it's out of favour. I heard a saying, you only brush the teeth, of the, the only teeth you brush are the ones you want to keep. <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't sound a bad strategy. Um, you also mentioned, Don, about a class action lawsuit and join with other councils. Just expand a little bit on that for us, please. Well, Fluoride Free New Zealand is putting that same question to all the councils to see if there's interest from several councils to come up with a class action lawsuit. So I don't expect you to answer that now or even next month, but let's see what develops. Obviously, there could not be a lawsuit until, and assuming, the Director of General Health says, bang, mandatory fluoridation. So we'll get a request to come to us from that at a yes. later date. Okay. That'll be much later. Yep. Thank you. Lynette, you have the last question for Don. I was just going to tell you I was a school dental nurse and I painted regularly fluoride on children's teeth when they came into the dental clinic. But just noticing um, your study on fluoride, you've given us the rural towns and uh, rural towns in the rural area. Has there been studies between the city? Because we found the city kids often had worse teeth than the rural towns. Not that I'm aware of, not directly mm. comparing rural areas with town. Um, I will leave behind you the breakdown of uh, area by area study. Well, not, it's not a study, it's the data collected by the uh, dental school system for the whole of New Zealand. And you could look at different areas and say, well, this is primarily rural and this is primarily urban and, and get a feel from that. But it's not specifically that. Thank you very much for your submission, Don. It's much appreciated. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Um, and our last um, speaker for this afternoon to speak to this submission is Liz Dupree from the Rakaia Library. Um, and it's on page 489, councillors. Welcome, Liz. What? No, 489 it says in this. Thank you. I've got the support of the Chief Executive. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not having any talk. Thank you. Are you, thank you, Lizzie. You, you ready? Thank you. thank you. So, kia ora koutou, and thank you for this opportunity of being here. I'd, um, my name is Liz, and I live in Rakaia, and I have with me um, one of my fellow librarians today, and we have representatives okay. from um, Mount Summers Library and Methven Library. And so this is our opportunity to just to talk a bit more to what we have already sent in. And I guess what we really want to say is that um, we realise we all run under a slightly different model. We have slightly different premises. And actually, but we've all been here for well over 100 years in many forms. And we, um, I guess in the 21st century, have a bit of a commitment to improvement and growth in our libraries. Uh, when we started looking at where we fit within the big picture, we realised we uh, linked to the Local Government Act, um, which we know that you have an obligation to provide free public libraries, and we are very appreciative of the one that we have in Ashburton and the support that we get from them um, as rural um, communities. And while Ashburton is um, considered our district library for all of us, uh, many of the residents in Rakaia, Methven and Mount Summers uh, make use of their local facility on a regular, re on a regular basis um, because many of them travel as an issue um, and for many of our elderly residents um, getting books 
that they can read at home is an issue for them, let alone travel to Ashburton. We all know our members really well, and we know the sorts of books they read, so therefore we can, um, we can design our collection to our community. Also, we realise just in talking together that for the likes of Mount Summers, uh, they like a lot of high country books, a lot of their, their members like those books. So we looked at the comparison between Christchurch City and Ashburton District, and you'll see here that um, they have 19 libraries, uh, a one library bus, which is certainly under a bit of scrutiny at the moment in the, in the media, but the communities are trying to keep that. Uh, they have one library to approximately 19,000 people, and the furthest the ratepayer there has to travel is five kilometres. And when you look at that in relation to what we have in our district, um, we have a lot less people, but we actually have one public library to approximately 35,000 people, and the furthest that many of ours have to travel is 40 plus kilometres. And at the moment, our three rural libraries are operated by volunteers, um, and we do have access um, to a maximum of $5,000 per annum each to purchase books, and we're very grateful for that. Current statistics that we've um, I've looked on your community profile page, and uh, Rakaia is in the Eastern Ward, as you'll be aware of, um, and Methven and Mount Summers are in the Western Ward, and totally um, those two wards have a population of over 14,000, whereas the Ashburton Ward um, have a population of 18,000. We feel in a way that um, it's important we keep these libraries in the rural areas and that we can keep up the quality of what we want for our communities as much as we can. And I guess our current grant is pretty minimal in allowing that to happen. <coughs> um, at the moment, our current grant, we can only spend it um, on the purchase of books. It's quite clear in the criteria that comes with the application for the grant. Uh, we all have a lot of extra expenses, uh, stationery, um, the covering of books, the repair of books, um, power for our facilities, and for some of them the upgrade and the upkeep of buildings is, is, is quite an onerous um, task on the local communities. And they're usually covered by fundraising from volunteers who are already given their time and energy to actually operate the library. We've had a bit of a look at your District Council library policy, and I see it's a bit overdue for review. Uh, they say that it would be reviewed every three years, or is required, and it was last reviewed on 14th of December. I guess the thing that, that really makes us feel not quite as um, valued as we could be is the fact that under Clause 7, uh, it states that 7.1.2, that... Um, Anything that no longer meets the collection criteria of the Ashburton Library or are no longer required may be donated uh, to community libraries and district charities. And I think, you know, there's plenty of second-hand bookshops around, but we don't want to become one of those. We want to be libraries where we have the latest issues, and especially for children's books. Children these days are very aware of what's out there and what are the latest books to be reading. They get that in their schools, um, but they also we have quite a high proportion of children who actually join our libraries. So we have a bit of a vision that will be known as innovative, progressive and interesting places for our communities. And to do that, we really have to have the funds to purchase uh, a range of new titles. And I guess what we're saying here when we are uh, thinking about um, some recommendations that we'd like you to consider, we're not talking about equity of funding here, we're talking about equity of opportunity to be able to improve things to the way that we want, um, that, that, that we have a bit of a vision for. So we would like consideration to be given uh, to increasing the amount available to the three rural libraries each year. We can't give you a figure of what we, of what we would ideally like because okay. each library is quite separate, but I think part of that could be um, in consultation or negotiation with, with what are our current needs and where do we want to grow. Um, we would like the policy to be looked at um, and we would quite like that to be done in consultation with us because currently your policy says there's no consultation required. And we'd quite like you to think about if there could be an allocation um, for a pr proportion for some of the expenses that actually we incur. 
We believe that the success of our submission will be measured by resident satisfaction and increased lifestyle opportunities, which is one of the goals in your 10-year plan. And we also believe that our rural libraries play a really important part um, in our small communities by improving literacy and reading opportunities. And just to finish off, um, just I think we want to be nurtured, we want to be allowed to grow, but we actually need um, we need the funds and we need the, the, the opportunities to be able to grow in our own way, in our own communities, in a way that will actually support what you're also providing here. Thank you, Liz. Faye, do you Thank have you. anything you'd like to add to Liz's submission? No. Thank you. No. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Councillor Liz. Hi there, how are Hi. you? Um, thank you for your submission. I just have a question on um, the funding that we allocate. Um, and it was just for purchasing books, but I'm sure in the last funding round we um, had an agreement that it could also be used for covering books. Did that get through to the community libraries or was that not... It did through to Methvin. I think the request did come from Methvin um, to me, and, that, and I mentioned it in the last, and it possibly was even last term of council, but um, maybe we just need to re, re look at that. Thank you. Sorry, you'll have to come to the front if you. Yeah. yeah. Well, just, yeah. Thank you. Are uh, you finished, Liz? Yeah. Okay. Um, Lynette, you have a question? Yes, I'm just going to ask um, the country libraries, on average, what are the hours that you open and how many days in the week are you open, please? Um, we open, we have three sessions a week um, and we've, I guess, kept it to that. We have increased it since some of us have actually stepped up. I think our library was in very much in danger of closing um, because we have to make sure that we can we can have the people to actually provide the time on a regular, reliable basis. If we say we're going to be open, we have to be open. So is a session, Liz, an afternoon or a morning, or what um, is the session? Usually two hours. Two hours, uh, yes. Okay. So they're two, two hours, hours on different days yes. of the week. Different, okay. different days of the week, and we have one night of the week um, <coughs> that we open. So, that people <coughs> so would that'd be four week. sessions, or three no, in total? Be the three. three in total, including yeah. the evening. Um, just one question before we go to Neil. Have you asked for more money previously, or is this the first time you've approached council for additional funds? Well, this is the first. I mean, I think Faye and I have only been, um, until we came on, our, the Rakai Library was pretty much guarded by a, a bit of an inner guard. Sure. And um, our local book club actually came in and very slowly have managed to just move things along quite nicely. Okay. Um, so this is the first time that I have, I have been aware that, that we actually have the opportunity um, to ask Thank you. for an increase. Yeah. yeah, up until a few years ago, the, um, those three libraries weren't funded at all. They got nothing because they're not deemed to be part of the Ashburton Library, that is satellite libraries that um, people of the, the, those districts um, want to get up and running, which um, which is good, and we, we supported that with those dollars to buy some yeah. books. So, um, but this is going the next, next step. Um, Liz, you talk about you don't get the latest books out, coming from this library out there, and oh, councillors, I think when we discussed this last year, that you were to get some the new books. So we'll follow up on that. Yeah. Um, we have to see what the decision was, but I thought it was that you got some new books. You didn't have to wait for they got so old before you got them yeah. on a loan basis. Um, Can I just say that applies to children as well as adults? We're not allowed any of the latest children's books either. Okay. Yep, we'll, we'll look into that. Um, we're building a new library there. Yeah. At the moment, it's started, and it's going to be bigger, better, brighter than it's ever, ever been before. And it's also going to have some more staff in there as well, so we're spending more money on the library in Ashburton because of um, the size of it. So there's even, the government's given us some money for a couple of extra staff, might be three extra staff in the library there now, ready for that um, time it's government funding money. Do, have you any, any interaction, do you have much interaction with the new staff or the staff of the library? Uh, I just actually met Jane yesterday because she has some brochures she wants to take out to Rakai Library, which I took for her. Um, Joel, I I can email her and I'll get a very good response from her. Um, we'd really there was a post on the Rakai Facebook page just just recently. One of 
my members actually mentioned that is there anything going for children in the school holidays about reading stories? Now that's something that would really welcome somebody coming out and um, doing something if, if there was staff there that were willing to do that. Um, so we're really open to using our library in any way that we can to actually bring the community into it. Yeah. So you've obviously got the context there, so it might be yep. you feeding back in and asking yes. and then see what your responses are. But, yep. but thanks for coming and presenting. Thank you. And you have a quick question for Liz? Yes, I do. Um, just, just looking up your uh, submission, on the point number three, it tells me there that oh, zero eight percent between the three rural libraries. Is it a mistake? So I'm just looking at the original. So that's breaking down the yearly amount. Is that the bit you're talking about? Oh, you yes. stand the yeah, original, and then you yep. say this point zero eight percent. Yeah, I mean. Maths isn't my strongest point, but I have... Library yeah. I, I would I hope that, that that's... I, I have passed it by Neil Pluck, who assured me it was, <laughs> and a high school maths bad. teacher, but... Um, it's, it's, I think it's about 8%. I'm prepared to be slightly out there, but it's... Slightly. Seems <laughs> to be... It's 8%, Liz. Is it 8%? Yeah. So we have more than one. Right. I thought it was... No, so it's... <laughs> is that your question, Elaine? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Angus, would you... Uh, uh, thank, <coughs> thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm just trying to clear something up. Uh, Liz, yep. can you please tell me who said, quote, we were not allowed new children's books? Well, I think, um, I think we went into the, I personally went in to get children's books from the library and I was told I can't have this one, I can't have this one because they're new books. So they were taken out of the ones I had chosen. That was sorry. one of the children's so, Sorry, items. sorry. Yes, yes. Ooh, ooh. Okay. Well, we, okay. we'll talk about that offline. I'd like to thank everybody for attending the session this afternoon and to thank the watchers online and all the submitters, and I appreciate your time. So now we'll have a break till 3.30, I think it is. 3.40, thank you.